So I was just minding my own business scrolling through YouTube and the algorithm looking down favorably decided to recommend a video titled Does Fallout 4 Have a Story Problem? by a brand new YouTuber named Ronnie Fivebad. It's a good watch and I recommend you check out his channel. In this video, he lays out a theory I've actually heard several times from various sources, that the main quote unquote problem with the Fallout 4 storyline all stems from the sole survivor themselves. But is this actually a valid argument? Well, buckle up boyo, because I'm Grey, you're watching Grey Gaming, and today we're going to try and determine if the sole survivor is the cause of Fallout 4's story woes. Oh, and just in case it needs to be said, spoilers Ob obviously spoilers we're talking about the story guys first let me start by reiterating that this is not an attack against ronnie fivebat as i said i actually enjoy his content and he does make some compelling arguments also i've seen other content creators forum participants and other internet personalities that have made similar claims i am simply attempting to address and determine the validity of what i'll call the sympathetic soul survivor theory for reasons that i'll explain later in this video from the moment that we select nate or Nora as our character, we are accepting a different paradigm from any previous Fallout game. We are agreeing to follow the actions of a predefined character with a specific backstory. We are either a lawyer living in pre-war Boston or we're a recently discharged military veteran living in pre-war Boston. As spouses, both characters live in the same house, are parents to an infant named Sean, have the same robot butler named Codsworth, you get the gist. You then watch the bombs drop, escape to the vault together, are frozen, and then you're forced to watch your spouse murdered and child taken. From this point onward, every action that you as the player take is predicated on the assumption that the protagonist is trying to find their lost son. Therefore, followers of the sympathetic soul survivor school of thought determine that this is a bad practice for a role-playing game because you, the player, are forced to take actions that you personally may not want to take, instead being forced to act in Nora Nate's interests. Ronnie, like others who take this position, points to other Bethesda titles and the God Emperor of all Fallout games, New Vegas, as examples of games that give you as little backstory as possible into the protagonist, allowing you to fill the gap with your own narrative, allowing you to become the hero of Kavach, the lone wanderer, the Dovahkiin, the courier. Little to nothing is known about you other than current circumstances when you start the game, so you can, in effect, become the character and act in your own interests rather than the interest of a character that has already been set. Bethesda RPGs certainly take this approach the majority of the time, giving you what is essentially a blank slate to work with, but is this to say that there is no such thing as a good RPG that forces you to play as a set character? Two key examples of franchises that do just that come to mind, Mass Effect and The Witcher. Yeah, you knew I would throw in references to these if given the chance, didn't you? Mass Effect sets you as Commander Shepard, a space navy seal with one of three set personal backgrounds and one of three possible military backgrounds. These constraints are fairly limiting and although your background is rarely brought up as a plot device, it's always there, popping up in random conversations resulting in new random encounters and coloring the player's opinion on what sort of action Shepard should take. The first game, which sets the tone for the entire trilogy, very quickly takes a similar approach to Fallout 4. You get dropped into a semi-idyllic universe, then conflict arises, then you are wronged by a villainous character who is not the actual big baddie but is nonetheless a goal which we must strive toward defeating for much of the the game. Sound familiar? Now Mass Effect 1 is undeniably the weakest in the trilogy, but not necessarily from a story perspective, but rather due to gameplay and pacing. The main story, however, is solid. Looking to The Witcher, the first game does try and give us that blank slate, unfortunately through the overplayed, even by 2007 standards trope of protagonist with amnesia. Even with a fish out of water approach, your character is still known to be Geralt of Rivia, a monster slayer, a mutant who is despised by society until his services are required. Required. Little else is known, but as you progress, you find endless references to your pre-amnesic past as described in the Witcher novels, which serve as prequels to the games. Even with this vaguely defined character, you still end up taking actions in favor of someone else's interests, something that even Geralt himself should, in theory, have little actual motivation for as he has had little time to get to know the people around him. The second and third games in the Witcher trilogy give you more of Geralt's backstory and memories, and further deepen the well-developed character of Geralt of Rivia. For 
forcing you, the player, to take actions in Geralt's interest rather than Clam Digger 42069's interest. It also is worth mentioning here that each Witcher game story is inarguably better with each new game. The upcoming reboot and sequels remain to be seen, but the original trilogy is fairly solid. If the argument against set character protagonists was truly the case, shouldn't the Witcher games have gotten worse to play as time went on and Geralt's character became more inextricable from his actions in the plot to each game's story? Other notable protagonists that are very well developed and defined are Ezio Auditori from Assassin's Creed and to a lesser extent Desmond Miles, John Marston and Arthur Morgan of Red Dead Redemption fame, Cal Kestis from the Jedi Fallen Order and upcoming Jedi Survivor games. I could go on, okay I can't, but I think my point has been made regardless. So why does this firm protagonist identity work for franchises like Mass Effect and The Witcher, but not for Fallout 4? More to the point, would the story of Fallout 4 actually be better if Nate and Nora were removed and in their place you were left with generic male-female options? Well, here's a hot take. N no. I'm going to try to avoid offending my entire viewer base here, but Fallout 4 tried to do something that Fallout had never done before. They tried to force the player to empathize with a main character. Something that all Bethesda games to this point have always done is throw you into a dungeon and let you choose how detached or invested you want to be. This is sort of what most people who play open world RPGs are after, a sandbox to play in. That approach has usually worked because as humans it's easier to act in self-interest, to take the action that we personally would rather take, knowing that there's no real world consequence we may be more adventurous than we would if approached with the same opportunity in our day to day lives. Given the opportunity to be a tyrant or a hero, which do you take? We want to explore those options, it's entertainment, it sort of becomes an exploration of ourselves in a way. Do we even feel good about ourselves after making such a decision? A much more difficult task as humans is to put ourselves in someone else's position, to feel what they feel, to take the actions that they would want to take. Consider the situation situation of your elderly neighbor falling and injuring themselves. You may wish to do something nice so you can mow their lawn for them or drag their garbage bins to the street so they can be emptied. It's that ability to sense when a friend is having a bad day and want to cheer them up. That's called sympathy. It's a fairly easy emotional state to reach. Empathy on the other hand is not so easy. It's not just being able to do nice things for someone you like, but to truly understand and anticipate the needs and desires of others before they happen, to take action in their best interest interests, even if they hurt ourselves. It's the ability to not just sympathize with your friend in a bad relationship, but also to understand why they entered into it in the first place and why they remain. To become part of someone else's experience, rather than to just look at it from the outside and say, yep, that happened. To look at both sides of a political debate and not just understand the motivations for each side, but to actually view the conflict from the perspective of someone who experiences an issue from a different vantage point. Nate and Nora are the equivalent of a choose your own adventure book where you do not get the option to make a decision until the second chapter, after the main characters are introduced. You are confined by the limitations of your character, but that doesn't mean that the adventure is any less of an adventure or that your options are in any way diminished. This information leads the sympathetic soul survivor crowd to say that's too much work, you're expecting too much from fans and players. If players have to make a conscious decision to accept the game's premise, then the game has obviously failed. But has it really? Every gamer has a preference for what sort of games they like to play. Some prefer graphics that are hyper-realistic, almost indiscernible from live action, while others prefer a more animated approach to graphics. Some people prefer real-time strategy, first-person shooters, role-playing games, platformers, sandboxes, some prefer fantasy settings, others science fiction, some may prefer something more contemporary. The point I'm trying to make is we all make a decision whether to accept the game we're playing. A lot of times you may choose to play a new game either because you heard good things or you saw gameplay footage you liked or you played other games in that franchise and you liked those. But beyond this decision we initially make whether to start playing, eventually we all make a decision whether we intend to keep playing. That's why Steam has a two hour gameplay grace period where you can choose to get a refund if it doesn't fit your interests. At some point, there's, for lack of a better term, a social contract between the video game and the player. Are you going to commit to my story and its conventions, or are you going to move on to other things? Fallout 4 offers
offers this contract very early. The problem is, Fallout has never required a contract of this kind before, and players simply were not prepared for it. Instead, Fallout 4 had tried to move away from a sympathetic protagonist and towards an empathetic one. We aren't a nameless, faceless prisoner serving a life sentence for a crime we don't remember committing. We aren't an amnesiac courier who's trying to track down the person who took their package, shot them, and left them for dead. We are Nate, a loving father who left military service in favor of living a peaceful life with his wife and son. We are Nora, an attorney, a public servant, and loving wife and mother. The problem is that players who gauge Fallout 4 against all other Fallout games want the easy path. They want a sympathetic protagonist, one where they don't have to think too hard about what constitutes a correct decision. They just want to be plopped into a situation and take whatever action seems like it might lead somewhere interesting. They do not want to understand the devastation of watching a child taken because that's not fun action taking. That's icky emotional stuff that belongs in chick flicks. In short, Fallout players want Fallout to be an action adventure, not an epic adventure. But is either genre really better than the other? No, it's just a difference in style. The exact moment in Fallout 4 that signals that you will not be accepting a blank slate character isn't anywhere in the prologue or the early game, mid game, or even the finale. It's in the opening cinematic. You can hear the desperation and fear in Nate's voice as he talks about the slow decline of society and the looming threat of nuclear war, of his desire to keep his family safe, of the dread and foreboding of events that he has no control over. This is one of the most powerful first two minutes and 30 seven seconds of any video game I've yet played, and the more I watch it, the more I have to hold back tears because as someone who's played a Fallout game or two in my life, and knowing the title of the game, I know that his greatest fears are inevitably going to manifest. I've also started getting choked up every time I have to leave Earth and say goodbye to Garrus in Mass Effect 3 or find Ciri's body in The Witcher 3. At first I was worried I was growing emotionally unstable, turns out nope, that's just empathy. The ability that allows you to move past the characters on the screen and actually step into the story for a brief moment. Which is sort of the definition of role-playing, guys. One final note that I think is lost on the proponents of the sympathetic soul survivor is that even in games that offer no context into who the player is, there is always a path you the player are expected to take, whether you want to or not. In Oblivion, you must find the only surviving heir to Uriel Septim and bring an end to the Oblivion Crisis. In Skyrim, you must must stop the dragons and sort out a civil war. In Fallout 3, you must find your father and restart Project Purity. Even in the infallible, flawless, incontrovertible Fallout New Vegas, you must figure out what you were carrying that was worth being shot over and find the person who did it to you. Even if you have no desire to do these things because this is your character and your story, you will inevitably have to discover these things if you want to keep playing the game. So even if we did chuck the entire emotional component of Fallout out for. We ditched the opening cinematic, the loving spouse and parent routine, the mad dash to Vault 111, and started as an amnesiac, again way overplayed, who wakes up to find someone across from them being killed and their baby taken. We will still inevitably find ourselves running into Kellogg, finding the Institute, meeting Sean, discovering our past. The rest of the story is still a hot mess of factions whose actions don't fit their ideologies, of people, places, and events that make little sense when viewed outside of a vacuum. The only difference is that now, the one thing that every player character actually needs is now missing. The entire argument that you're only acting because it is what Nate or Nora would want, even if you the player don't, is a lazy excuse taken by those who just want the easier solution, ignorant of the fact that without it we just have a sandbox, a place filled with enemies that need killed with no reason for our character to actually exist. The simple fact is that RPGs that center on a defined protagonist do exist outside of Fallout 4 and are quite successful. The problem is, is that this style of RPG has two key requirements, one of of which Bethesda had little to no control over, and another over which they absolutely did. The first requirement for a successful, defined protagonist is that this requires a certain level of emotional maturity from their audience and a willingness to become a part of the story, rather than a simple desire to escape their own world for an hour or two. This is, unfortunately, up to the players and dependent on their interests and preferences. It's one thing to say, I want to play Fallout today. It's a completely different thing to say, I want to be the sole survivor for a little while. The second requirement for such an approach to be successful is that the story must be inviting, detailed, and most importantly, 
good. Bethesda very nearly accomplished the first two with the cinematic and prologue. There were a few minor things they could have done to give equal weight to the subtle but important differences in Nate and Nora's circumstances and experience, and a few things that they could have taken a bit more seriously or handled a little less ham-fistedly, but overall they came, in my personal opinion, very close to successfully creating characters and backdrops that invite the player into their roles. However, it is the rest of the Fallout 4 story that is so contrived, so haphazardly written, and so dependent on the assumption that an inherent plot device exists and that the audience recognizes it, that it's impossible to remain grounded in the fiction of Fallout 4. It's filled with factions and people that are just plain awful, not evil, just badly written. By the time you've met all the key players, experienced the factions and their leaders, found the major cities and societies, you've lost any chance of maintaining empathy with the sole survivor. Each misstep of the story plot, each shallow character you're required to interact with because it's required to progress the plot, each mind-numbing radiant quest completed is forcing a renewal of your gamer contract. Do I keep playing? or is this no longer a world I am a part of? This is where Bethesda well and truly failed. It wasn't with the concept or premise of the sole survivor, but their ability to maintain an emotional connection between the player and the sole survivor throughout the story. It is with this basic supposition that I say the sole survivor does not fail the Fallout 4 story, but instead it is the other way around. It is the story of Fallout 4 that fails the sole survivor. Whether you agree or disagree, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Let us know your feelings, or if those are too icky, your logics in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, a quick zip into VATS to sink some AP into the like button would be appreciated. As always, it's been real, stay safe, and we hope to see all of you Soul Survivors later, right here at Grey Gaming.